We uh, are going to continue now with uh, a conversation about what is happening in the energy sector around the world, a sort of tour of the world, um, with representation from China, from India, uh, folks who are at the forefront of deploying capital uh, in energy infrastructure all around the world, the intelligence and national security perspective, uh, and the policy perspective uh, with senior representation from this administration's State Department. And I'll let uh, John Elkind introduce the panelists, and I'll just introduce John, who uh, joined us about a year ago as a research fellow and senior research scholar at the Center. Before that, he served as the Assistant Secretary of Energy for International Affairs and for Policy at the U.S. Department of Energy, uh, has worked in um, prior jobs in government, worked in think tanks like the Brookings Institution, uh, and is doing a lot of work uh, for us on issues around international energy, international climate, uh, and other things. It's really been a fantastic addition to the team to have John, when he left the Obama administration, join us at Columbia University. I'll turn it to John Elkind. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you to all of you in the audience for being with us uh, here today. Uh, we shift from the conversation that uh, David Sandelow just moder moderated on climate change and technology uh, to a, an outlook at what is happening in global energy markets. Uh, in this segment of the program, we are going to survey a number of different issues that characterize uh, the times that we're living in in terms of global energy markets. We'll be looking at dynamism in conventional markets, sharpened competition from clean energy technologies, important new geopolitical relationships, challenging politics and geopolitical risks in countries around the globe, and last but not least, competing policy priorities, whether one is talking about trade or the climate issues or investment. Um, we are therefore extremely fortunate to have uh, with us a superb panel uh, of leaders from the United States, China, and India. Uh, who can help us to interpret where our global energy world is going. They are uh, Chairman Fu Chengyu from, uh, from China, former chairman of Sinopec and Sinuk, uh, uh, and today, among other affiliations, a member of our advisory board, for which we are very grateful. Uh, next to him, uh, Avril Haines, uh, who is senior researcher for Columbia World Projects, a major initiative of uh, the president of this university, Dr. Lee Bollinger, former deputy national security advisor and former deputy director of central intelligence. Uh, next to her is Matt Harris, who is founding partner of Global Infrastructure Partners, uh, where he leads uh, GIP's focus on investments in energy, water, and waste. GIP is a modestly sized investment company that only has uh, f greater than $40 billion in assets under management, as I understand it, uh, with employees across their invested companies in excess of 21,000. Uh, next, we have Dr. Ajay Matur, who is Director General of Terry, the Energy and Resources Institute in New Delhi. Uh, he is also a member of Prime Minister Narendra Modi's Council on Climate Change and has uh, had an illustrious career before that. Last, certainly not least, John McCarrick, Acting Special Envoy and Coordinator for International Energy Affairs at the U.S. Department of State. Thank you all very much for being here. So uh, let me remind those of you in the audience um, uh, that you may submit questions through at Columbia U Energy and the hashtag uh, CGEP events, uh, or you can send your question by text message using the number that is in your program. Chairman Fu, let me start with you, because obviously uh, what happens in China is certainly a topic of great focus uh, in, uh, for those of us watching energy markets. Earlier today, we had a roundtable discussion on the future of the natural gas uh, uh, markets, uh, and probably the biggest question that was on people's minds there, uh, there was, what is happening in terms of China's natural gas demand? There has been dramatic growth in the last years. Should we expect a continuation of that dramatic growth in natural gas demand in China? Well, there's uh, two aspects about the natural gas. One is uh, from the demand side, which grew very fast, that especially last winter, the, the demand really expected the, the uh, beyond expectations. and 
got a lot of gas shortage. And uh, however, if you look at the other side of the supply side, and China gas supply is uh, actually there's uh, three sources. One, domestic natural gas production, which is just above uh, 13 billion, uh, no, 130 billion cubic meters per year, and then pipeline from Russia, from uh, Kazakhstan, to Turkmenistan. So this is uh, more or less the same volume. And, and then there's uh, LNG import. It's uh, somewhere around uh, 20 million tons per year. And so this is not enough. Not because just uh, the, the uh, demands from normal production demands and then also from the environmental requirements. You know, the pollution issues there causing uh, all people from the ordinary, ordinary public people to the uh, business, to the government officials, they, everybody believe this is something we have, to, we have to do using clean energy. But most available clean energy is gas. So, and if, if we look at the, uh, the uh, next 10 years, there's tremendous requirement or needs for the gas. And certainly there's other renewable energy grow very faster, but because of a percentage to the total consumption is still small, even the, the growth risk, growth risk is quite high, but total volume is still small. So gas is the most available resources that can meet the demand in China. As I understand it, also the, the, uh, some of the new requirements that have led to the retirement of coal-fired boilers in Beijing and Shanghai, some of these same requirements are now being spread to a, a, a broad number of other major cities in China. Is that accurate? And, and do you think that uh, the coming winter there will be uh, adequate supply to meet the demand? Actually, it's not in the major cities, but in the uh, tonnage uh, uh, area, the, the remote areas like a tonnage city. And uh, this was planned one year ago to shut down the coal burning uh, boilers. But when the winter is coming, they, they found out there's not enough gas. So they have to let them to re-burning uh, the coal. And in the total country, uh, the real issue for the environmental issues is the coal that burning by families in the countryside. This will be somewhere around 300 million tons totally. But the township burning using big boilers is about 100 million fifth tons, so half and far half. Mm. So those are the major uh, the, the pollutants. So this, I think we, one of the, our efforts to, to replacing those 300 million tons of coal that burning by families, replacing by either gas or other uh, renewable energies. Well, and certainly the reports that I have heard from colleagues that have been in Beijing recently talk about some uh, significant uh, improvement in the air quality there, uh, to be sure. Uh, Ajay Matur, I wonder if I might pose the next question uh, to you. Um, uh, certainly, India's uh, very dramatic uh, development in regard to energy has been another one of the big uh, cardinal stories, if you will, in the period that we are living through right now. Uh, Prime Minister Modi has extremely ambitious uh, goals in mm -hmm. terms of electrification and access to energy and the fuel mix, um, should we expect uh, to see rapid growth in uh, India's uh, energy sector? If so, which areas would you highlight as those likely to be the most dynamic? John, one of the things that I must say surprised me was the speed at which the prices of electricity from solar have declined. Today, a kilowatt hour of electricity from solar costs less than a kilowatt hour of electricity from coal. I had not expected this to happen in my lifetime. 
The second economic transition we are moving to is that the price of solar electricity will be less than just the price of coal in that kilowatt hour of electricity. And once that happens, then the distribution companies who have already paid for the capacity charge will say, I'll buy solar. Why on earth should I pay for uh, coal electricity even if I've paid the capacity charge? And the third transition which we expect would occur somewhere in the mid-2020s is when the battery price largely becomes half of what it is today. Because at that point, solar plus storage would provide us electricity wherever we want, whenever we want, and at a price which is less than that from new coal power stations. What that means is that by the middle 2020s, energy demand keeps increasing, but it's met by solar and storage rather than by coal. That would be such a dramatic shift in the given wisdom, the conventional wisdom of the growth of the electricity sector in India. And, and what role would you see there uh, in India's future for natural gas? Uh, with Secretary Perry having been yeah. in Delhi this week, uh, it was announced that uh, some of the early deliveries from the Cove Point uh, facility, the LNG export facility in Maryland, are going uh, to Gale, the, the Indian mm -hmm. uh, company. What role do you see for natural gas imports or other consumption in India? So gas is performing a very important, but a very different role in the Indian energy mix as compared to other countries in the world. Uh, you know, till two years ago, or even a year ago, coal was the cheapest form of electricity. Now, of course, solar is. But renewables, solar and wind, had a must-run status. What it did was it squeezed the gas out of the electricity market. As we move to the future, however, we see that the kind of demand that would occur in the hot, humid months, and the kind of demand that occurs at the onset of winter is a very large difference. And it's so large that having solar capacity to meet all of it would be very, very expensive. So what we foresee is that the seasonal variation might well be met by gas. That's one part. But the second area which we are very excited about is the use of LNG, particularly for transportation, truck transportation, because long distance transportation today, as in all parts of the world, depends on diesel, but there is a lot of work going on on using LNG for transport. There's this chicken and egg situation. Does the, do the trucks come, LNG trucks come first, or do the LNG filling stations come first? Well, the filling stations have to come first, and that's why the LNG supplies are important. Matt Harris, this might be a, 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 an ideal time to bring you in. You've just heard from your right and from your left uh, lots of uh, call for uh, LNG export, and I'd be interested to know uh, GIP's sense of um, how much more build-out you anticipate seeing in the infrastructure space for liquefaction, uh, and then also for, for regas around the globe. Mm. Well, we're, we're big believers in the future of LNG. Um, as electricity gains a greater share of the energy market around the world, really, we're going to need gas-fired generation in addition to clean energy play a major role in that. What we've seen over the last three to five years is a coming online of a significant amount of new LNG capacity, uh, both in the US as well as Australia. And the market over that period of time, in most people's eyes, has been oversupplied. Mm -hmm. We're starting to see now a tightening of that market. Um, and I think you're going to see that happen more rapidly than people think. One of the uh, developments that's occurred over the last couple of years has been an increase in LNG import utilization by countries that we had not traditionally seen that from. Pakistan, Bangladesh, uh, Vietnam, uh, all countries that are uh, seeing a greater electrification of their country and need this resource. So we think that the U.S. is very well placed 
because they have a significant amount of existing capacity where you can add brownfield uh, liquefaction at a relatively attractive cost. And then there are also a number of very attractively priced products, uh, projects around the world, Mozambique and others, that we think will lead to, uh, to this development. So I, I think to answer your que question directly, yes, it's going to happen. I think it's going to happen more rapidly than people think. There are a lot of changes in the market. The way that gas is sourced and the way these contracts are structured are very dynamic. I think it's going to lend itself to a lot of innovation in the marketplace, like what uh, Tellurian is doing in terms of the way they're structuring their companies and their contracts. As we look at what we want to invest in over the next three to five years, there are three primary things. One, one is renewable energy, two is uh, shale gas and tide oil, and the third is LNG infrastructure, both on the liquefaction side and on the regas side. Excellent. Thank you very much. Let's take a, a, a turn now to look at some of the geopolitical elements of the, the global markets. And Avril Haynes, I'd like to um, ask a, a, you a question. Uh, uh, Ryan Lance, uh, in his remarks with Dan, er Dan Jurgen earlier, said that he thought that today is not a time of exceptional challenges in the geopolitical landscape. But if one looks at Iran and Venezuela and a number of other, uh, the Korean Peninsula, et cetera, there certainly are a number of big geopolitical challenges. Um, in your view, are we living in more turbulent times than uh, we were a few years ago? Uh, is, or is that an exaggeration? Are, are we living in a time when countries are uh, perhaps more inclined to use energy as a political weapon than was true in the past? So I think. I think um, we are living in times where there is increased geopolitical risk. I'm not sure that translates necessarily to geopolitical risk for energy in the same way. So in other words, I'd say that uh, there's an increasing complexity and pace of threats and challenges. And you can look at just the increased degree of mobility around the world that lends itself to an increased pace of threats related to, for example, pandemics. In other words, when there's a pandemic in one part of the world, it will potentially come to your shores that much more quickly as a consequence of some of the trends that we see today. There are a variety of uh, complexities uh, associated with those threats given the variety of different types of disciplines that are necessary to really unpack issues today. The integration of technology and economics and foreign policy and all of these other things add to that. I'd also say that the fact that we have uh, moved in a sense from a bipolar to a multipolar power structure in the world today means that there are more actors, more sort of potential issues that have revolutionary impact across the spectrum that you have to think through. I think the demographics are such that we're seeing trend lines, not just in increasing populations, but aging populations and a variety of other areas that you know constrain and uh, add to the limited resource issues that we face and that can spark conflicts and other things that we have to think about but so there's plenty of opportunity for risks and geopolitical risk what i do think is true as well though is in the energy sector it seems to me that there's increased potential for resilience in a way and given the diversification of energy sources which obviously we've just heard about from a variety of perspectives perspectives. I think in addition to the way in which energy is generated, there are more opportunities for more countries to be capable of being resilient in today's world than there used to be in some respects. And I think that's added uh, you know, complexity to this question of how much risk is there in energy and what's the impact that it can have in these various areas. The, the final part of your question, John, I'd say that goes to this question of um, is it used, is energy being used in a sense more as a political tool in a way? And uh, and I think historically, we've seen energy used as a foreign policy tool for decades and decades. I don't think that's new in many respects. And uh, you know, what I do think is interesting is it's been in the news a lot, particularly in the context of Russia, using it uh, with respect to Ukraine, vis-a-vis -vis Europe and their essentially uh, reaction to Ukraine, the, uh, in Venezuela, as you know, their investment in SICO and otherwise. Uh, their investment in uh, essentially in Iraq and a variety of other areas where you see 
you know, Russia using it as foreign policy tool. I think the United States has also used energy in different ways that are related to foreign policy, such as in the context of Iran, for example, doing sanctions that related to energy uh, was an important part of the process that led to the Iran deal. And I think, you know, Trump, obviously, President Trump has talked about energy dominance, and I think there are some questions as to the extent to which that's being seen as another foreign policy tool. I think the harder question is just where is it acceptable and where isn't it? And where should we be concerned about it and where shouldn't we be? And how do we actually put limits on the degree to which countries use it in ways that we think are unacceptable? And I think that's always an issue. There are a variety of different areas where that comes to the fore and you know we see norms get developed in those spaces. Great, thank you. Um, John, I guess I'd like to ask you first to, to, for your thoughts on uh, the same question of the use of um, energy as a, as a political tool. Um, uh, and then I'll do a follow on with you on, on kind of your sense of geopolitical risk largely. Are, are we living in times when uh, energy is used more as a political tool than it was in the past? Um, I think that it, it is being used as it has been in the past, but I think um, it's partially been blunted um, by the shale revolution we've experienced here in the U.S. Um, our ability to impact markets in terms of how much we produce and how many barrels are coming on every month um, it has a tremendous impact on markets. The, the, the issue, though, about the risk related to political risk um, is, is really almost impossible to answer because the risk is a market risk. The, there's the political risk, and then that's the gating issue until you get to the market risk. And I think in a lot of ways, um, the market risk is, is the variables to that I'll leave to others on the panel and here in the room. Um, but, I, but I can say that, it, yes, of course it's still being used as a tool, especially you know, with uh, the Russians in Ukraine and, and um, the pipelines through the Ukraine. Um. So I, th I think a lot of people noticed the, uh, the statements that were made by the uh, Chancellor of, of Germany, uh, Angela Merkel, uh, about a week ago uh, when she said that one piece of energy infrastructure that has attracted a lot of attention, Nord Stream 2, uh, shouldn't go forward unless there was a settlement of the energy relationship, the natural gas transit relationship in particular between Russia and Ukraine. Do you think that's, uh, in this context of uh, energy and its interaction with politics, do you see this as a as news making? Is this a, a departure from where Germany has been uh, Absolutely. Yeah, this is, this is uh, we viewed this as a seismic event that mm. probably was not as covered as much by the media as it should have been. Um, this, you know, the, the, the position that she has taken previously has been, well, that's just a commercial enterprise uh, that's not political and she's finally acknowledging the, the facts on the ground that it, it truly is. And so yes, we view this as being a, a tremendous opening and, and welcome it. Okay, thank you. Um, so let's turn, we've spent a lot of time focusing on uh, conventional fuels and, and the markets around them, uh, but I'd like to also ask, uh, engage the panel in discussion a little bit um, around uh, new energy technologies. Um, Obviously, as has been uh, noted by a number of analysts, uh, many of the new energy technologies, whether one is talking about um, uh, batteries or wind turbines or uh, solar panels, they rely on specific, uh, uh, well, the term that is often used is rare earth elements, although in point of fact, they are not rare in their, in their incidence. Um, is this a potential challenge for the development of a clean energy economy. Do you, um, I'll start with, uh, Matt, I'll start with you because you said that renewables are one of your areas of focus for investment. As an investor, are you worried about the adequacy of supply of cobalt and lithium and other such uh, minerals? I, I think the answer to that is no. I mean, certainly, you know, we, we've got a portfolio of uh, including our development pipeline of in excess of 20 gigawatts of wind and solar energy. And we, we haven't seen any evidence that over the medium and longer term that that's, that's going to be a constraint. I think the market will balance itself out. I think the, the need is there. I think Ajay said, which to me, many of these decisions get driven by economics as they should be. 
And the facts today are that on what we call the levelized cost of energy, both wind and solar energy are cheaper than any other source of energy. And that has to, in our opinion, win the day, which is one of the reasons why we've been so active in putting together this portfolio. Ajay, um, obviously the, your prime minister has uh, enunciated this uh, very ambitious goal for 2022 of 175 gigawatts of incremental, uh, mostly wind and solar. Um, are Indian decision makers worried about the availability of uh, critical mi minerals for the, the new energy economy? Worried, yes. Would it be a deterrent? No. The challenge actually is somewhat different. I think as uh, Matt mentioned and was discussed in the previous panel, the issue really is would it be available at all times? Could it become a strategic issue? The long-term thinking is that it wouldn't. It would remain a, a market issue. However, the energy market that we are moving to, as has been said many, many times, is a more volatile market. The demand is becoming more volatile, and the supply, because of the intermittent nature of solar and wind, will become more volatile which means that the necessity of having batteries becomes ever more stronger. The challenge is, would we be able to move towards technologies that allow a far greater amount of recycling of the rare earths than we could do in the past? And if we are able to get to technologies which are, in a sense, disassemblable, uh, so that you can take the rare earths out and use them in the new technologies or the new products that are being made, that to a very large extent would imply that the strategic stranglehold of rare earths would no longer be there. Chairman Fu, I wonder if I might pose this, essentially the same question to you about minerals, uh, the availability of minerals for uh, new energy technologies. Uh, from time to time in the United States, there has been press coverage that expressed the view, and I'd like you to comment on the view, that has expressed the view that Chinese companies were seeking to control or to dominate the market for these rare earth minerals. Do you believe that this is a fair or an unfair assessment of the intentions of, of Chinese companies? Uh, first, first of all, Chinese companies have no capacity to control all the mining capacities. And uh, second, the companies, if they want to involve with the mining uh, or minerals, they have to make sure that they're economical operating than this. And so if you just talk in, in, in a concept, people don't know what will happen. If you look at the economics, whether, whether or not this may, will make business, uh, re, re, making money, that's another story. So, one, there must be market. Second, there must be uh, a good operation system and that can lower the cost, which must be very efficient operations. And third one, you have to compete with your, uh, mm. your peers. So all those put together, you see, business will, we're not looking the just say whether or not the resources, but we'll look at with the current resources whether, whether or not you can make economics. Thank you. John, I'd like to turn to you and, and go to the kind of the, the overarching issue of geopolitical risk and, and how do you uh, and your colleagues at the State Department evaluate geopolitical risk um, uh, as you look around the globe. Uh, where do very, you see... Very carefully. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Uh, in relation to energy, um, what do you see as being the areas of the globe that pose the greatest geopolitical risk? Uh, is it tensions in the Gulf? Is it uh, the Korean Peninsula? Is it Iran? Is it Venezuela? Well, Elsewhere? DPRK is, is the, the 
sanctions that we're using in DPR are energy sanctions, but it's not an energy issue. The issue is their missile program and their, and their uh, nuclear program. Um, so it's, it's, that's not really an energy issue. Um, yes, of course, the Middle East, uh, for some time, as Avril can attest, has uh, been a, a flashpoint for, for energy and will continue to be one. Um, I don't think, uh, with the current situation in Syria and Yemen, that um, you know, th there is a, a, always a tremendous um, concern at the State Department that that will become some sort of a flashpoint. And again, an, uh, several, the whole Gulf area is still um, you know, a large producer of oil and uh, could have tremendous impacts on the markets were there to be um, some sort of problem there, shall we say. Okay, and I feel I'd like to, to come to you now on a modification of that question around geopolitical risk. Um, John alluded to the use of sanctions by the United States. Um, obviously, the Obama administration, in which we both served, also used uh, sanctions uh, in a couple of specific instances. Um, in hindsight, or as you reflect on both that time and the current time, um, do you view sanctions as an unavoidable part of the landscape, an overused part of the landscape? A, a, uh, how, do you, how do you assess that? Sure. So um, at various times during the administration, particularly because we just continued to use sanctions in a, a series of foreign policy uh, areas building on the work that the Bush administration had done, but uh, we use them in more areas, I would say, and continue to expand on it. One of the critical questions that would come up is, are you actually damaging the economic system that the United States benefits so greatly from by sort of you know, engaging in a series of sanctions? And one of the key questions within that was whether or not we would, uh, in effect, have an impact on the degree to which the dollar is used as the reserve currency. And honestly, we went through a fairly exhaustive review on this and talked to a lot of outside experts, inside experts, a variety of people across the board. And it was very interesting, from my perspective at least, but found it was essentially a near universal view that no, in fact, there really is not a credible alternative to the dollar as the reserve currency. In fact, it's very unlikely that the way we use sanctions is going to essentially eat away at that uh, possibility. And that, of course, you know, you need to um, be sensible and how this grows may make changes to these assessments, but ultimately that it was a very useful Tool. I think one of the key uh, concerns from the sanctions perspective, though, is just that if you're going to use it, you have to actually have an off-ramp, right? Because the point of using sanctions is to influence behavior. And in fact, if you are successful and you influence behavior, you have to be able to actually lift the sanctions. And you need to be able to think through how you're doing it in a way that allows businesses to be able to interact, and banks in particular, obviously, to have as much kind of certainty and understanding and clarity about what the sanctions are, what the sanctions aren't, how they're going to operate, and how long they're going to last. And so that's, you know, I think the piece on sanctions. And obviously, it interacts with much of the energy pieces that you're talking about. What is that? Yeah. Thank you. If, if I might, please, just, just yeah. to add, I think maybe some folks in the audience might not understand the way sanctions work, is that typically they target financial institutions. And because, when you were talking about the dollar, because the dollar is so um, preeminent with financial institutions and, and transactions, people want to be able to use the dollar. And so that's, the sanctions are financial sector sanctions. That's all. I just thought, I, I'd like to turn this question a little bit to, to Chairman Fu in, in the context of the, the use of the dollar in, in uh, international trade. Um, we have seen reports recently about the creation of the uh, the natural uh, excuse me of the oil futures contract based at Shanghai and uh, denominated in renminbi um, is that uh, development well could you tell us how we should understand that development is it a response to uh, uh, the the predominance of the dollar in international trade you know this is uh a lot of scholars and researchers, not researchers, the, uh, re, uh, the journalists, they try to see and uh, influence some people saying that the uh, Shanghai Futures uh, is going to uh, using RMB for, 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 for the Korean, and this is to replace the US dollars. But this is a really, uh, perhaps some some people's goodwill. However, I, I don't see that will happen. Because first, 
there's very few brands of crude being traded. And even in the future, you know, there's uh, refineries in China is a focus on a very narrow quality of the petroleum. And second, there's no one single brand to be traded. They just, in each of the future market, you have either you call WTI, you call a brand, or you call other names and compare with them. There's no such brand. And third one, that will be very small volume for at least for a few years. If say 20 years later, I don't know, but say next five years, they mainly for domestic purposes. And I don't believe there's a lot of international trader and to participate in there. And only Chinese traders, companies like, like what I served before, each year we, I bought at that time about 1.2 billion barrels. That's a lot. And so we bought from other markets. But when we have a Shanghai markets, but still we can only bought a small piece. Majority are from international market. So this is something that people, maybe they have a good will. However, I don't think there's a uh, physically and technically uh, operatable to really become a big international future market. Thank you. Um, so one fuel that we've not talked about so far is nonetheless still very important uh, in the global energy economy, and that is coal. Uh, and so I'm very interested uh, to ask uh, a number of the panelists, and you're all, of course, invited to jump in on this, um, how you see the future of coal. Maybe I might start with you, Ajay. Um, coal remains, as we have discussed, a, a very important piece uh, of the energy mix uh, in India. Moreover, it is, uh, in a, from a sociological, socioeconomic standpoint, it's also very important in terms of employment. Mm -hmm. um, how do you see the future of coal in India? Uh, John, allow me to step back a little. You know, there's no country in the world which has been able to have afford a good quality of life for its citizens. And I use a human development index of 0 0.9 as a surrogate for this. Without using at least four tons of oil equivalent worth of energy per person per year. Right? Countries which developed early used more. Uh, the Chinas, the Koreas are at four. The point is that as the infrastructure technologies become more efficient, this number falls. India today is at 0 0.6 tons of oil equivalent worth of energy use per year. So the energy demand will increase as prosperity increases. That's one part. And the reason I want to emphasize is that it is, this is what is so different about India and the industrialized countries like the US. We still have an increasing energy demand. The issue is, how is it met? Is it met through coal, or is it met through other sources? Clearly, with a very large number of people having very limited incomes, what is important is that they need energy, and they need the cheapest energy that they can get. That is why this becomes an issue of economics. Today, the cheapest electricity that you can get at any time of the day is from coal. Yes, solar is cheaper, but only when the sun is shining. So what we look at, foresee, is that in India, the amount of coal that is used will keep on increasing for some time. And sometime I mean about 10 years. At that point of time, electricity from solar plus the storage will become cheaper. And I expect, at that point of time, the new electricity generation capacity would be based on solar or in storage rather than coal, which means that coal use would stabilize. 
And as the power stations, the coal-based power stations retire, it would start decreasing. So we see a 30-year cycle before coal use becomes very, very small and negligible in India. Now, 30 years, in my view, is a generation, which means that if the coal mines, the lifetime of miners and the lifetime of investment is planned, it is quite possible that we may, I won't say avoid a socioeconomic problem, but minimize the socioeconomic problem. The issue is, of course, can it be planned, uh, which is a larger question. Chairman Fu, I mean, uh, China has, as you commented, gone through very difficult uh, problems with air pollution, largely uh, resulting from coal consumption, uh, and now has started to institute new policies uh, in, uh, in a number of Chinese uh, cities. What's the future of coal in China? Okay, for those of you who don't know about how much coal that China consumed, I just uh, give you a roughly uh, a picture. Uh, say, seven years ago, 70% of total primary energy consumption is from coal in China. Seven years after last year, dragged down to 62%. And per current planning, the uh, next five years will drag down to 53%. However, still a lot, because the total consumption is very big, and there's a 53% uh, is, is a very big one. And, but there's all the good uh, two uh, areas that really, really encouraging. One is the government policy. When you discharge CO2 or discharge other pollutants, you will pay higher cost. For the business, you have to seeking either new technology or you have to do something to, call, to burn less or using less of coal. And second, and the technology progress are really encouraging. They call clean coal technology. Currently, there's at least a three power generation plants running on coal, but the, the efficiency is a lot higher than before, and the discharge of pollutants can compare with the gas. So this is a very encouraging technology, and now 70, 70, called milligram, gram, gram, can generate in a thousand watts per hour. Normally in the past about 100, now it's 70. So if such a technology can spread out, I think that can get a lot of problem, uh, troubles out. Because mainly the efficiency of coal are plated and this charge will be less. So if currently the running such can compare with the gas uh, turning power in terms of SO, SO2 or NOx or whatever, the same. So this will be the new technology that help China to continue to push less coal and but helping on the environmental issues. Thank you. I'd like to ask a, a kind of a closing shot question to, to all of the panelists, and I'll ask you to, to go in turn. Maybe Chairman Fu, if you don't mind continuing. Uh, today, we, uh, as Jason noted, we mark the fifth year anniversary of the operation of the, the Center on Global Energy Policy. Five years from now, when we reach, when we reach 10 years, would this kind of a conversation about global energy markets be more complicated or less complicated as a result of action on the climate issue? Do you care to start us off? If to my experience, especially in China, and looking uh, into the other part of the world, I believe there will be more talking on green and low carbon energies. 
conventional with the technology progress, I think it will be more efficient and less discharge. But the, even though the percentage of the consumer energy in the future will, it will be more and more coming from renewables. Avril, will, the, will climate make this conversation around global energy markets simpler or more complicated five years from now? I'm not sure I'm qualified. <laughs> You've got so many better qualified people on the panel. But I would say I, I expect um, it will be challenging, perhaps even more challenging in five years, just because based on the people that I know and respect who think about this a lot see us as being very unlikely to meet many of the goals that we've set for ourselves in the context of climate change. And I think that is going to put an enormous amount of pressure on us to be thinking through how it is that we address these issues. And, uh, you know, that's going to be one of the great challenges. And even though I think it's absolutely right that it'll be more on low carbon, and I see that as a trend line, I still think it's not matching up with what the political interest is on a global basis, that is. Thank you. Matt, obviously, you have to make um, smart, far-sighted calls on investment. Uh, how do you see this? John, I, I think we strongly believe it will be more complicated. The, uh, I believe that the five years from now, we will have underestimated the pace of change by which renewable clean energy disintermediates the traditional energy markets, at least the way we've known them for the last 50 years. And that comes down to two things. One, economics, where I believe the technology changes that we're seeing in the world today will continue to drive down the cost of renewable energy and pressure from shareholders and, uh, and other constituents. I mean, just going back to the coal issue for a second, well, we do own some coal infrastructure today. We're under tremendous pressure from our pension fund investors to not invest in coal further. And I think that pressure I, with firms like ours and even big oil companies is only going to grow further. Ajay, over to you. Uh, five years from now, is our conversation around global energy markets more or less complicated as a con consequence of climate? As you asked this question, I was looking in my pockets if I was carrying my crystal ball. <laughs> Unfortunately, I'm not. It's because you got to your hotel late. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, the future is going to be certainly more volatile. And it's going to be more volatile because of two things, neither of which we touched on today. And Jason, five years from now, you may think of these as the questions to address. The first is enhanced energy efficiency. One of the things that volatility is doing to the markets is bringing in a much stronger economic case for energy efficiency than has happened till now. And the second, because of all these changes, whether it's the greater amount of renewables, whether it's greater amount of uh, energy efficiency, is five years from now, we will be discussing the problem of what do we do with these stranded assets due to coal, due to petroleum. The problem will be that once renewables and, and efficiency are economically more uh, uh, effective, what on earth do we do with all the money that has gone into the fossil fuel sector? Thank you. John, last but not least, how do you see this question? I see, again, the crystal ball. I, I guess I would ask everybody in the audience to imagine not just a five-year question, but a 10-year question. And 10 years ago, we hadn't even fathomed the concept that we would be exporting yes. natural gas. We were actually concerned that we weren't going to be able to import enough natural gas. So I'm not going to, you know, the other thing is the State Department School of Public Speaking, they te teach you not to do hypotheticals. So um, I'm just going to leave it as I, th I think it's, it's, it is going to get more complex, but it's, uh, I'll say I'm hopeful that it, that it gets easier. All right. Well, with that, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you will join me in thanking an incredible panel for their great observations. <laughs>